Hi, I'm Remington Agni Campbell, and this is the History of Musical Theatre podcast. It took a team of incredibly talented people to change the world of musical theatre. The first of these was composer Richard Rogers. The Rogers household was an extremely musical one. He described his mother, a pianist, thus, Not professional, but she played beautifully, and she was the best sight reader I knew. His father was a doctor, but as he recounted, someone said the best place to have a heart attack was at Philharmonic Hall. They were sure to be a doctor in the same row as you. His father sang, Not well, but with love. Music, particularly show music, was played each evening before and after dinner. In those days, cheap music was sold in the lobby of Broadway shows. Like CDs or t-shirts are sold now. Richard's parents were regular theatre attendees and brought these scores home. Then his mother would sit at the piano and begin with the overture, playing all the way through the show over a series of nights. These shows included The Pink Lady, Oscar Strauss's The Chocolate Soldier. Richard Rogers recalls being able to picture the scores. He also started playing music really young. As a small child, he continually attempted to play the piano by ear, considering six years old to be the time he started playing. He studied for a while with his aunt, until after not too long, he surpassed her skill. During this time, he also had his first experience with live theatre, a children's production of The Pied Piper, which changed his life. Throughout his whole life, theatre was his happy place. If you're happy, you go to the theatre and you stay happy. If you're sad, you go to the theatre, and you become happy. While he was exceptionally skilled at the piano, it was not a path available to him, as in 1910, the bone marrow in his hand got infected. His father, a doctor by trade, had to slice his hand open and remove the infection. I would personally say one of the best things about the relationship with my dad is that he didn't wake me up in the middle of the night to cut my hand open. Just personally. It was necessary, though, as it was pre-antibiotics. Furthermore, the process had to be repeated to drain the wound. Firstly, ow. Secondly, it led to Richard having to take a year off from playing the piano until his hand recovered. I guess if my dad cutting my hand open ended up pushing me away from something I could be great at towards something I could be exceptional at, world-changingly exceptional at, I I could probably find it in my heart to forgive him. But still, ow. Being somewhat limited in his piano playing now, composing started. And it also started young, at age nine. When asked in an interview later in life what he did before he was a composer, he answered, I was a baby. In 1917, he went to see the Spring Varsity Show at Columbia University. The university had always interested him, partly because of its variety shows. There, his brother took him backstage, and he met a very tall, skinny fellow with a sweet smile, clear blue eyes, and an unfortunately mottled complexion who would one day be his chief collaborator. The two wrote a few songs together for a charity benefit concert, but their partnership wouldn't begin in earnest until after Hart. 23-year-old Lorenz Hart was first introduced to 16-year-old Richard Rogers by a mutual friend, and they started working together immediately, and succeeding together immediately. Hart was different from Hammerstein in a few ways. He was small, hardly more than five foot, with a somewhat gnome-like appearance. He was described as having features that were individually all quite handsome, but that his head was rather too large for them. 1919, mere months after Rogers and Hart had started working together, saw their song Any Old Place With You appearing in a professional show. I personally think it's somewhat confusing and frankly rude of Mr. Rogers that both of his partnerships could be described as R&H. 
if you want to license a Rogers and Hammerstein show, the website where you'll find those details is rnh.com. That that doesn't include the heart shows. I'm starting to guess that he didn't make his partnership decisions based on what I would find easy in the historical record, which, again, is selfish. Rogers and Hart wrote the Columbia undergrad variety show, Fly With Me, set in a then-futuristic 1970s. Columbia would have more significance in Rogers' life than he knew. The high quality of variety shows was what attracted him to the school. He went there with Hart, and it was where he met Oscar Hammerstein, who would eventually be his main writing partner. It was at the grand old age of 17 that Rogers wrote a full score for a professional show, Poor Little Ritz Girl. Ritz like the crackers, R-I-T-Z. Well, while Rogers and Hart did write a full score for the show, only a handful of their songs actually ended up going into the production. On opening night, they found that the score was full of songs by Sigmund Romberg, who was well known for adapting Viennese operas for Broadway, as well as a few Al Jolson vehicles. Now, Al Jolson is an interesting figure, and I may have to concoct some ingenious scheme to talk about him in the future. The Rogers and Hart partnership had begun with a bang, but it started to fizzle out almost immediately. People often call this time their apprenticeship, which in hindsight seems apt, although at the time it may have felt more like five years of banging their head against a brick wall. Both Richard and Larry began studying at Columbia University, although the former later transferred to the Institute of Musical Art, which is now known as Juilliard. Many years later, an interviewer asked him why he went to study music, having already had a degree of professional success. He gave an answer in three parts. I wanted to learn the names of the things I'd been doing all my life. I went there because I wanted to learn music. I went there and I learned more than I ever did in high school or college. While they were undoubtedly progressing in their skills, the seeds of the end of their partnership had already been sown. Larry was a chronic abuser of alcohol. He had a complicated youth and adolescence. His father said he worked in real estate, but was really involved in a series of criminal activities. The family alternated between wealth and poverty, and the elder Mr. Hart was eventually convicted of grand larceny and fraudulent use of males. Rogers would describe the Harts as unstable, sweet, lovely people. Hart was also gay in a time when homosexual acts were illegal, and it was something he worked really hard to keep a secret from his mother. Ultimately, the story of Larry Hart is a pretty tragic one. Professionally, his alcoholism also affected him. He was only able to work in a short burst between his pre-lunch first drink and the late afternoon when he'd be incapacitated. During these early apprenticeship years, the pair wrote a series of frivolous titles. You'd be surprised, say mama, you'll never know. Say it with jazz, the Chinese lantern, jazz a la carte, if I were a king, a Danish Yankee at King Tut's court, and temple bells. A Danish Yankee in King Tut's court has so much going on in a title, I I can't even picture what that would look like. Earlier in the episode, you may have felt like an utter failure compared to 16-year-old Richard Rogers. By the age of 23, he felt that way about himself. It was 1925. He still lived at home. He was almost ready to leave show business and go into, of all things, wholesale baby's underwear. A friend offered him a job doing just that, at $50 a week. Richard asked for a day to think it over. Do you remember last episode when I mentioned the Garrett gaieties? Well, welcome to the most deus ex machina turn of events. That night, Richard Rogers received a call from the Guild Theatre. They were planning a variety show to raise money for the purchase of some tapestries, for which they offered absolutely no money. Hart was apprehensive at first, but agreed partly because of the prestige of the guild. 
Most theatre going on in New York was very commercial, but the Guild used a subscription model, the kind that is used by a lot of contemporary theatre companies. And that let them produce riskier shows, offset by the more commercially viable shows. There's a more in-depth episode coming about the Guild Theatre and its history, as well as Teresa Helburn, who was actually one of the main driving forces behind Oklahoma. She's not someone you may have heard of, but I think you'll find her very interesting. Back to our main man of the episode. I understand the confusion. I also use the term about Oscar Hammerstein and the Garrett Gaieties. The plan for the review was to run one Sunday. It ran maybe a touch longer than that. First, the team negotiated some additional matinees, which were standing room only. Then Rogers asked a bold question. Can we take over the regular run? And what do you suggest we do with The Guardsmen, the show that was already running at the time? Well, they closed it, and the Gaities took over its run, for a total of 211 performances. Somewhat more than one. Richard and Larry were both given a royalty for the show. $50 each per week. Richard also conducted the show, for an additional $83 a week. For those doing the maths, we are $83 and one fulfilled dream up from the underwear salesman position. From the Garrett Gaities, the pair really took off. As the book Something Wonderful recalls, within a year, Rogers and Hart would have three shows running on Broadway at once. In 1930, Richard Rogers married Dorothy Fainer, who he was... faithful to? Well, they were married for a long time, but Richard was a known womanizer, and he was involved in a world which was full of young, beautiful chorus girls. Dorothy was patient. Dorothy was a fairly successful woman in her own right. She started Repair Inc., which was an agency designed to link tradespeople with people who needed things fixed. Basically the early 19th century version of Fiverr or TaskRabbit. Basically, I'm saying she's the Silicon Valley tech CEO of her time. That would have been impressive on its own, but she also patented the Johnny Mop, which is basically a disposable toilet brush. She showed it to Johnson & Johnson, and they started producing something really similar, which she did not get paid for. But it didn't stop her from designing. After that, she designed the Basically Yours dress, which another company went on to produce. I believe she got paid this time. She also wrote both children's books and books on housekeeping and wifery, wifing? How to wife? I know I've also already said that she was the Silicon Valley taxi over time, but maybe she was just the Leonardo da Vinci of traditional women's work. The point is, she was quite impressive. <laughs> now, back to the boys. The pair would write a total of 28 stage musicals together, over a period of about 20 years. Some notable shows from this significant list include 1926's The Girlfriend, which was so quintessentially a 1920s musical comedy that The Boyfriend is basically named after it. 1926's Peggy Ann, a second edition of The Garrett Gaieties, also in 1926. 1927's A Connecticut Yankee, 1935's Jumbo, 1936's On Your Toes, 1937's Babes in Arms, 1938's The Boys from Syracuse, based on Shakespeare's A Comedy of Errors, 1940's Pal Joey, and 1942's By Jupiter. That's a super incomplete list. The pair wrote a lot of shows. It is impossible, of course, for me to cover everything you might want to know about all of these shows. I mean, hello, I'm spending a whole season on Oklahoma. But I wanted to share some interesting facts about a few of them. The premise behind Peggy Ann 
is a kind of Freudian dream scene. There's a later musical, The Lady in the Dark, which is often credited as being the first psychological musical, but as we've learnt, musical theatre history is not always super accurate. Peggy Ann was the pair's fourth show. Now, venture a guess as to the time between the opening of the pair's fourth show and their fifth. One day. Betsy opened the day after Peggy Ann. Writing musicals based on Shakespeare plays is not new. I'm planning at some point to do a whole season talking about this phenomena. But why did Rogers and Hart decide to adapt a comedy of errors? There are so many more obvious Shakespeare plays and even more obvious Shakespeare comedies. Well, largely because of Teddy Hart. The play centres on two sets of identical twins who are separated at birth, one of each set finding themselves in each location, with one set of twins being the masters of the other set of twins. It's an improbable setup. And the comedy of the play is about the errors that that causes. Wow, it's almost as if that's why they called it that. But did you know that Larry Hart's brother, Teddy, was often confused with another comedian? This was in large part what inspired Rogers and Hart to choose this particular play. By Jupiter is sometimes considered a sort of successor to The Boys from Syracuse, the musical based on a comedy of errors. The plot centres on a conflict between the Greeks and the Amazonians who are led by Hippolyta, a name flagrantly stolen from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, I assume. But it wasn't going to last forever. Hart's alcoholism got increasingly worse. What is this first step in writing a show? The music, or the lyrics, the characters, the story? Well, for Richard Rogers, it was finding Lorenz. Through all of this, though, Richard stood by Larry. The two of them got into heated arguments about lyrics and shows, but none of the arguments were personal. They were all in the interest of creating the best possible show. But it was hard for Rogers to work with Hart. It wasn't simply a case of going to his house and waking him up, although Rogers did often have to do that. But Hart often left the country. Going for a drink could often land Hart in Mexico. By Jupiter would be the pair's final show. It's a somewhat common misconception that the Rogers and Hart partnership broke up with Larry's death. Not quite, but it did break up with Oklahoma, and Hart did die shortly afterwards. But that's not a story for today. First, I need to introduce you to a few more key figures. Next week, we'll be looking at the early life of the younger Oscar Hammerstein and his series of hits, misses, and good enough shows in the world of operetta, and how a showbiz family tried to keep the budding lyricist out of the tumultuous world. I mean, if I'd bought and lost four theatres, I'd probably try and do the same. Until then, I hope you have oh such a wonderful day. Mm-hmm.